Hey everybody, welcome back to another Today's Voice video. And in this video, we're going to be jumping back into our study of the 10th chapter of the Book of Romans, which we've been discovering is more along the lines of an exposition between two very different kinds of righteousness. And specifically what we're going to be getting into is this whole concept of the righteousness which Moses describes, which is really self-righteousness, having two sibling spirits of mind or attitudes of heart. So <clears throat> these two sibling uh, spirits of mind or attitudes of heart, um, we will always find when we encounter the righteousness which Moses describes. And remember, in addition to the righteousness that Moses describes being self-righteousness, this righteousness also happens to be the very spirit of the slave or servant. Uh, you know, in Galatians chapter 4, it says that Christ, or when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore... Now just kind of maybe pause and rewind that. He has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father... Wherefore, Galatians 4, 7, Wherefore, you are no longer servants, but sons. And if sons, then heirs of God through Christ. So, um, the spirit of the slave, or the spirit of the servant, it actually is the spirit that is prevalent across mainline mainstream denominational Christianity and has been for quite some time. And the proof of that is in the general Christian's perspective of God being a Pharaoh in heaven. Um, last video I alluded to the fact that in the prophet Ezekiel, uh, Pharaoh, uh, the symbol for Pharaoh is actually the dragon. And I guess before we jump into Romans 10 here, just so People know that I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, why don't we go over here for a second to the book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> and we're going to go to the 29th chapter of Ezekiel. And uh, you remember in the book of the Revelation, um, that revelation um, was being sent, or ex excuse me, sent and signified uh, to his servants. A uh, different word for servant, not to be confused with a servant or slave, but that kind of servant is actually a bond servant, which um, is a different kind of a servant. Um, and, and we'll get into that some other time. But um, the book of the Revelation was signified. Uh, signified comes from two words, sign and ified. So the, the Revelation, the book of the Revelation, has been signified. It's written in signs and symbols, which means there is a wisdom and an understanding that are necessary to discerning the meaning of the book of the Revelation, because contrary to popular belief and opinion, the book of the Revelation is actually a love parable. It is not, nor does it have anything to do with what mass-marketed, mainline, denominational Christianity has painted it to be through all of their poorly read C movies. <laughs> and I don't even know if I would call them B movies. C at best. Maybe D. At probably F, because they have completely failed at communicating the heart behind the book of the Revelation, which is not the end of the world, and all of these scary monster stories, but the very word revelation in the Greek is apocalypse, which comes from two Greek words, apo, which means to remove, and kalupto, which, re which uh, means the veil. So by very definition, apocalypse means to remove the veil. It means the unveiling. And specifically, 
the unveiling of Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so uh, when we understand the signs and the symbols and what they are all pointing to, um, it is, it's not even in the same universe, to be honest with you, as a lot of this, uh, you know, these Christian films that have come out over the years that are, I mean, it's just fantasy. It's fiction, fantasy, fable. There's no truth in, in, in most of it. Um, so we've got to understand the signs and the symbols. And to understand the signs and the symbols in the book of Revelation, we don't really need to look any further than the Bible itself. Because if we um, have spent any time developing some sort of working knowledge uh, of the other 65 books in the Bible, well, those kind of hold the keys to the signs and the symbols. And so this is one instance of that being true. Ezekiel 29. Check this out. Ezekiel 29, verse 1, it says, In the tenth year, in the tenth month, in the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of Man. That is one of the titles for Jesus, Son of Man. Uh, set your face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers. I repeat that. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers, which has said, My river is my own, and I have made it for myself. So what we see here is the symbolism or the, the significance of the dragon, the sign of the dragon relating to Pharaoh. Over in the book of Revelation, go over there for just a second, because this is going to tie right into Romans chapter 10 and the righteousness which Moses describes and is going to really kind of clue us in to a lot of the fear-based motivations behind why Christians do what they do. And a lot of it has to do with an incorrect perception, a perverted perception of the Father. Um, and it's rampant. I mean, I grew up Roman Catholic and went to Catholic church and Catholic school. I went to Catholic church till I was 12 years old when I finally started picking up a King James Bible and reading it for myself. And I went to Catholic school in first and second grade. In fact, of the seven Catholic sacraments, I received every single one of them except becoming a Catholic priest. Or excuse me, marriage. I didn't get married in the Catholic Church. Um, I even received my last rites <laughs> because when I was a kid, about age seven, was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease and when they finally figured out what it was, my, my physical condition was so deteriorated that I was given two days to live. There's no medical cure. And that was my first encounter with the power of God and the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, which raised me off of my deathbed and enabled me to be discharged from the hospital three days later with a clean bill of health and no medical explanation as to why I recovered because of the known cases in the world at that time, I was the only one on record that survived. <laughs> so by the time I was 12, I had lots of questions uh, that very few people were able to answer. So it drove me. I felt a draw to the Bible. I felt a draw to the scriptures and uh, to really delve into, um, you know, what was in there. So... Um, I don't know why I'm saying all that, but, um, you know, from a very young age, I never, I had a great earthly relationship and still do with my natural father. And this might be a, a, a tough pill for a lot of us to swallow, but the fact of the matter is, is for the most part, for the most part, our first impression of God is our earthly father. And... That's a tough pill for some, a lot of people to swallow because of um, how most people had a father himself that was basically suffering through an identity crisis. 
We've had abusive fathers, verbal and physical. We've had non-present fathers, fathers who worked to provide things but never gave us their time. Um, you know, it, so when these things started to come to me and I started to become aware of them, um, it was not a great stretch for me to understand the heart of my Heavenly Father because I had a really good, and still do, have a really good earthly father who's always treated me well. Um, a lot of my life, my earthly father, um, because of the love and friendship and camaraderie he showed me when I was a kid, um, received the same from me as I grew up. And so when I started to understand and comprehend that God was far more interested in me discovering his heart as a father. <clears throat> that wasn't hard for me to do. And that goes all the way back to that encounter with the Lord when I was seven and dying. You know, it was my dad who got a revelation out of Isaiah 53, walked into the hospital room, pointed his finger at me, didn't pray for me, didn't lay hands on me. Just said, Johnny, do you believe Jesus can do anything? And I said, yeah, Dad, Jesus can do anything. He pointed his finger at me and he said, well, then you're not sick anymore. And all of a sudden I felt this warm oil, this warm heat hit the top of my head. It shot through my body and out of my toes like electricity. And all the pain that I had been in that was keeping me from sleeping. I mean, I hadn't slept for three or four days. Immediately left my body. And three days later, I was discharged, completely healed. Even the doctors came in and said, it's a miracle. We can't explain how this happened. So um, when I was 16, I started getting involved in a Word of Faith church and then some charismatic churches and so on and so forth. And uh, what has always been alarming to me is how Christians perceive God. And most of them don't perceive him as a father, much less know him as a father. And so over in the, the Revelation, uh, John actually points this out in Revelation 12. And you can think I'm full of it. That's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. But I've got, I've got too much in here that I'll back this up and validate this. In Revelation 12, there appeared in verse 1, a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet. This is actually referring to the seven churches. Um, and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars, and she being with child, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there's a reason for this. Verse 3, there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. There appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon. Well, what did we just read in Ezekiel about who the dragon is? Well, the dragon, in Ezekiel chapter 29, to repeat. Let's read this over here one more time. Now we'll just go to uh, Ezekiel 29, verse 3. The, uh, speak and say, Thus says the Lord, God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his rivers. The great dragon. You see, when the seven churches forsook the gospel of grace, and they all did, even uh, Paul wrote to his spiritual son Timothy and said that all they who are in Asia have forsaken me. Every church that Paul founded turned their backs on the gospel of grace. And by default, when we do that, we are going to hold a perverted perception of our Father in our hearts. And because we are in our minds, or we've become alienated from grace, we perceive God in heaven as a dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And when we perceive God that way, how we perceive Him determines 
the spirit of mind or attitude of heart that is then produced through us. So the beast in Revelation 13 also has seven heads and ten horns. The difference between the dragon and the beast is where the crowns are and why and how many. And so I'm saying all that to say this, is that the righteousness that Moses describes, let's go back to Romans 10 so we don't get too far off track because we could get lost in this for a long time. Uh, Romans chapter 10, let's just kind of pick up here in Romans chapter 10 verse 5. Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which does those things shall live by them. So the righteousness that Moses describes is a righteousness or right standing with God that is based on doing things. And I'm going to tell you the primary motivator behind it is fear. In fact, Galatians chapter 3 says that the law, our, 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 uh, how do I want to say it? our obedience to or performance of the dead letter of Scripture is not of faith. The Amplified Bible says has nothing to do with faith. Well, under the law, our performance of the dead letter of Scripture, our obedience to the dead letter of Scripture, if it is not of faith and it has nothing to do with faith, then what is it based on? Ah, perceiving the Father in heaven as a Pharaoh, a great red or fiery dragon, who is ever crouching and waiting to reward our obedience and punish every slightest disobedience. Therefore, our attempting to obey and perform all of what we perceive God is requiring of us. I should say what God is requiring of us based on the dead letter of Scripture in order to achieve and maintain right standing with Him. Our primary motivator is fear. It's the torment of fear. It's the, it's, it's the perception that a servant or slave has toward a master. I obey, I get rewarded. I disobey, I get punished, somehow. I obey, I get blessed. I disobey, I become cursed. Welcome to American Christianity. Another thing that I want to just touch on again, I've already said it, but I, need, I feel like I need to reiterate it, is that when we're talking about obedience to the law, when we're talking about the righteousness that Moses describes, what we are... What we are stating, and to reiterate, is that I am relying on my obedience to and performance of the dead letter of Scripture. I'm perceiving not only my Heavenly Father completely inaccurately, but even when it comes to the Scriptures, I'm taking everything so personally that i got to run out and do this right now, because if... I do, God will be pleased, and if I don't, he'll be displeased, and then what might happen? And so, um, remember, Moses, in a, in a simplest form, is the dead letter. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it's the whole chapter, it goes into chapter 4 as well, Apostle Paul stresses and emphasizes the difference between the spirit of the scripture versus the dead letter. And the difference is, that's why Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, study to show yourself, 2 Timothy 2.15, famous scripture, but we've never looked at it in this light. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There is a right way to, quote, divide the word of truth and a wrong way. The rightly dividing is the accurate discernment between the dead letter versus the spirit. And the difference results in just two diametrically opposed lifestyles. One sees God as a pharaoh. The other perceives him as a lamb. The one views blessings and love 
and favor based on performance. And so it feels it ha has to perform or measure up to some standard to have those things. The other perceives nothing from the Father but unconditional love and realizes that the blessing of God is not conditional on performance or obedience. The blessing is based on inheritance. And the blessing is actually empowering the life of the Son. It's not anything I do to earn it. It's empowering me to be who I am. Another thing we need to talk about. This is not about following our bliss. There is no scripture that says follow your bliss. Do whatever makes you feel good. Do whatever makes you happy. See, the fine print is the heck with everyone else. The scriptures don't say that the sons of God are led by their bliss. It says the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. And did you ever notice that those who are allegedly following their bliss, did you ever notice how very little care and concern they have for anyone else but themselves? Have you ever realized how wrapped up and caught up they are in themselves? And how dominated they are by their own emotions and feelings? And how they follow after these vain visions and dreams a lot of times that revolve around angels and all the weird things that people get caught up in? Just follow your bliss. And the irony is, is the ones that I personally know who are following their bliss are some of the most miserable, unhappy, unstable people I know. It's still self-righteousness. It is catering to self. It is catering to the God that I worship called ego, me, myself, and I. I don't ever remember Jesus talking about following your bliss. I do remember a Jesus who came to completely disclose the Father. And, uh, you know, when he followed after the pleasure of the Father, he wound up on a cross. Hmm. The sacrifice of self so that others can come into the knowledge of the Father versus following my bliss. We have become so much like the world, it's sad. Let's keep going. Romans 10. Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law that the man which does those things shall live by them. So in order to remain right with God, See, it's not just an issue of attaining it. Now I have to maintain it. I have to keep doing all those things. And remember from last video, we talked about the fact that there were more than Ten Commandments. There were, when you took the commandments, the statutes, the judgments, the ordinances, it was a combined grand whopping total of 613. And yet there are Christians today who are insistent that God wants is our obedience. Then, in the parable of the two prodigal sons, why didn't the father ever reward the older prodigal who was perfectly obedient? And if God's so bent on obedience, then why doesn't he punish the younger prodigal who, from all appearances, was disobedient and just foul? See, folks, neither we nor the world actually have a sin problem. What we are suffering with is an identity crisis. And seeing angels and having them blow gold dust over you and having gems appear out of thin air and all this crazy stuff that people follow after is not going to solve our identity crisis. Say, brother, you talk as if you're against the supernatural. Against the supernatural? I'm alive today because of the supernatural. 
miraculously healed when I was seven of an incurable autoimmune disease. Last November 4th, 2019, had a heart attack. Do I look like an individual who just suffered a heart attack? Three collateral arteries grew out of one artery, went around the blockage and kept supplying all the blood that my heart needs without any impediment so that I had no heart damage. I'm against the supernatural. The gospel is supernatural. Jesus Christ is supernatural. What I am against is making a God out of supernatural encounters and, in, and occurrences. You know, the scriptures talk about pursue after love and desire spiritual gifts. But we've got the cart before the horse. We're pursuing after spiritual gifts and desiring love. In some cases, we want love and respect for the spiritual gifts we think we operate in. As if operating in spiritual gifts sets us on the totem pole or something and, and demands that people worship us. There's a lot of demand for gift worship going on today. But the greatest gift of all is the love of the Father. And for the most part, the majority of us are still clueless about it. So, um, yeah, let's get into this. I don't know why I'm, I'm just feeling it, so I'm going with it. Um, Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which does those things shall live by them, or you know, fine print, die by them, or not doing them. Here's what I want to focus on today. But the righteousness which is of faith, we talked about what that was last time, speaks on this wise. It's, it, it talks like this. It has this flavor. It has this attitude, demeanor. The righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. It says, say not in your heart. Or in other words, don't say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. So that righteousness which is of faith, that really is the love of the Father speaking within our hearts. It's the anointing. It is the Christ in us, communicating himself in us and to us and wanting to communicate and manifest himself through us. That righteousness which is of faith is that Christ in us. It is that, it has, it's that divine spirit from the Father. It's like we talked about in the beginning. God sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That is that righteousness which is of faith. It speaks on this wise. The first thing that it doesn't say is, don't say in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. That's the first thing that it does not say. The second thing that it doesn't say is, who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. I want to talk about the first one today, in the time that we have left. Because these two attitudes, it's, it's, it's really their spirits of mind or attitudes of heart. One says, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above. And the other says, who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. It's two sibling spirits of mind or attitudes of heart that will always be connected with the righteousness that Moses describes. And remember, that's the righteousness of the servant. It's the righteousness of the slave. Therefore, these two things will always be based on performance or obedience and Together with that, we'll perceive the Father as a dragon and not as a lamb. So let's look at this first one. The first thing that the righteousness which is of faith, the Spirit of Christ, the, the anointing that is speaking within our hearts, the love of the Father that is speaking in us, 
the first thing that it doesn't say and it will never say is who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, back in the 90s when I was, um, I was meditating on this quite a bit, um, I'll never forget the day where I was, I was reading that verse and just gentle and strong, I felt in my heart, this is the stairway to heaven, John. And the next thing you know, that Led Zeppelin tune came to mind. Who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above? And when I heard that, across my mind, I saw all of these steps and formulas and patterns and outlines and equations and sequences and sequences of steps and protocols and... Uh, Performance requirements, obedience standards, uh, processes, healing processes, works in progress, all this stuff that requires us to take these steps and then at some point in our long drawn out process of obedience, which you know, it's a process brother, we'll eventually achieve some level of spirituality which, of course, the Christian bookstores don't tell you that you then need to maintain because James 2.10 kicks in and says, Oh yeah, by the way, uh, those of you who desire to keep the law, if you break one point, you're guilty of breaking the whole thing. Under the law, we don't get to choose which commandments we get to keep and which ones we don't have to. It's either all or nothing. And the fact of the matter is, is there has never been a single human being, you and I included, that have ever kept the whole law of Moses, nor will we ever. So let's just get over ourselves, shall we? The law actually is spiritual. Romans chapter 7 says so. The law is spiritual. And it is spiritual in the fact that it contains a hidden message called the gospel, which is actually Christ-centered and revolves around Jesus and his finished work and the enormity of it all. It does not revolve around you or me. But in order to discern that gospel, you have to have a spiritual mind, which is what Paul said, in his former days in the flesh, which is Romans, that's what Romans chapter 7 is actually referring to. His former days of the flesh. Let me clarify that. In his former days of thinking that his self-effort by keeping the law, because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, in his former days of thinking that his self-effort could measure up to all of the performance requirements and obedience standards that Moses set forth. He thought he could achieve and maintain right standing with God. So when he says that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin, he is referring to those days. Which is why the Pharisee of Pharisees was that deaf, dumb, and blind to the very hidden message contained in the law, the gospel, even while he was pouring over the law. The law is spiritual. He said, but referring to those former days of his flesh, he's carnal, sold under sin, which prevented him from realizing that, oh my God, what God was saying through Moses, it, he wasn't giving me a honeydew list, he was actually unveiling something regarding his son and the finished work of the cross. But I was so self-absorbed, so wrapped up in my own little world, so wrong in my thinking that what God really wanted was my obedience and performance, I couldn't see what was staring at me right in front of my face. And we're the same way today. See, the carnal mind is not what most people think, folks. 
The carnal mind thinks that it can make and keep itself right with God by doing what the Word says. Do you ever hear Christians talk like that? Well, it's in the Word. It's in the Word. Yes, but there's a greater revelation. The Word himself is a person, Jesus, and he is in you. Have you discovered him yet? Or would you rather worship angels than fellowship and commune with the one who created the angels to be your servants? The law is spiritual if it is viewed with the spiritual mind. And the difference between the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind is very simple. The spiritual mind has a revelation of God's righteousness. It has a revelation of the Father's love. And it has the capacity and the potential to see in every scripture, in the midst of every scripture, the cross of Jesus, the finished work, and how it relates to what the Lord is actually doing today in the earth. regarding the Father's purposes. The key is the Father's love. The key is the Father. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. You know, the word that he used there is actually the ancient word for Father. It's foundation. Upon this foundation, upon the Father, He didn't say that the rock was hearing from God. Although Peter heard from God, Jesus said to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, meaning that he was the Christ. He said, But my Father, which is in heaven, and upon this rock, not Peter's ability to hear from God, not Peter, not some pope dressed up in a Halloween costume 24-7, you want to talk about perverting the image of the Father, try the Catholic Church. Where they, I mean, that whole Catholic Church is based on the Old Testament priesthood, which is completely um, null and void. It's been, it's been nullified, made void. Dressing up in robes, that's Old Testament. And because there is legalism involved and performance and obedience required and penance, your ten Hail Marys and your Our Fathers and all that other stuff. See, that is the spirit of the slave. That's basically self-flagellation for the wrongs that you've committed and by penance you think that you can earn God's forgiveness. And the interesting thing about that self-righteousness is that self-righteousness and carnality go hand in hand. And isn't it any wonder why there has been such sexual misconduct in the Catholic Church? I mean, to employ priests based on a priesthood that is outdated and obsolete by Jesus' finished work, and to call and mandating that people call those priests, quote, Father, where there have been so many of them that have turned out to be pedophiles, and you're required to call them Father. You want to talk about a perversion of, of knowing God as a Father and as a Lamb, and how widespread that is, and I mean, the damage, the, in some cases, without a revelation of the Lord Jesus, I mean, in, in many cases, irreparable damage and harm. And I'm supposed to call some clown in a robe, Father. And they can't marry, they can't... It's all to please God. You will always find extreme sex, sexual misconduct where there is legalism and obedience to the dead letter because self-righteousness and immorality go hand in hand. The carnal mind 
is just as much a self-righteous mind as it is an ungodly immoral one. It thinks its own crap doesn't stink, and that its effort can measure up to and maintain what God is requiring, but it has never known the unconditional love of our Heavenly Father. That is what the devil and demonic spirits are at work at constantly to continually pervert the image of the Father. Jesus did not come to, quote, reveal God. In fact, I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm on it, but let's go with it. John chapter 20, this is right after Jesus' resurrection. The first person who encounters him in the garden is Mary, Mary Magdalene. I want you to see this. Um, uh, John chapter 20, check it out. Um, let's see here, where should we start? Verse 11 of John 20, how are we doing for time? All right. It says, but Mary, Mary Magdalene uh, stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. I could go so many ways with this. And sees two angels in white, sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And right there is your mercy seat. The two angels, the two angels, the cherubim, my God. The two angels, there's your mercy seat. the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. You know that the Ark of the Covenant on which the mercy seat sat, the Ark of the Covenant, you know the Hebrew word for Ark is coffin? Somebody died. And they say unto her, Woman, I... See... That's why he's the propitiation for our sins in First John. He's that word is the is the saint that's derived from the mercy seat in the Old Testament tabernacle. He is our mercy seat. He is the throne of grace. Check this out. He is the source from which all mercy and grace flow. Um they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Now check this out. Verse 15, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, and he is, says unto him, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Now, she still has at this point Old Covenant mentality. Servant, slave, looking to a master. But watch this. You remember Jesus before the crucifixion, uh, and I believe it was actually during the Last Supper with his disciples before his crucifixion, he said, he said, from henceforth I no longer call you servants, for a servant does not know what his Lord does. He said, I, I now call you, from henceforth, I call you friends. For all things that the Father has given me have I made known unto you. But see, there's something much greater than servants or friends, because neither servants nor friends have any right to family inheritance. Inheritance is not dispensed or released to servants or friends. Now we're talking after the cross. Now we're talking just after his resurrection. Check this out what Jesus says. She calls him Rabbani, which is to say, Master. Verse 17, Jesus says unto her, Touch me not. 
I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, my brothers. How many of y'all ever just took the time to read your Bible slow? Instead of, oh my God, i got to read three chapters today, or i got to read 10 or 20 pages today, you know, to keep the Lord happy with me. Maybe you just read it because you enjoyed it. Maybe you just read it because you... It just turned you on something fierce, man. Just slow, just contemplating it. That's why in the book of Psalms that word "silo" always comes up. I like how the Amplified says... Amplified Bible says, just pause and calmly think about that. You know, it's not a sin to exercise your gray matter. God actually does want us to think. It might actually do some of us some good once in a while. <laughs> Check it out one more time. Touch me not, I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren. Wait a minute. No longer servants, no longer friends, something much greater, family, brothers, go to my brothers. What happened? Well, the cross happened, that's what. This is the New Testament that is shed in my blood for the remission of sins. Hebrews says, that where a, t uh, um, a, a testament is only of force, a testament is only in effect when you have the death of the testator. Most Christians do not realize this, but the beginning of the New Testament is not Matthew chapter 1. It is not Mark chapter 1. It is not Luke chapter 1. It is not John chapter 1. The beginning of the New Testament, by definition, a new covenant, a covenant, it, it, means, it means where the blood flows. That's what the ancient word means, covenant, where the blood flows. The new covenant did not come into effect. The old covenant did not come to an end until the cross of Jesus Christ. Everything before the cross, I don't care if it is in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of John, everything before the cross is Old Testament. And everything since the cross is New Covenant. That's why the majority of our reading and studying and meditation in the Scriptures should be spent from the book of Romans through the book of Jude because those New Testament epistles to the churches contain the revelation of the fatherhood of God and our identity as sons and daughters. Just... You'll, you'll find that most of American Christianity does not revolve around a steady diet of the book of Romans through the book of Jude. Most of American Christianity revolves around what Jesus taught in the four Gospels and the Old Testament. That's why we're in the predicament that we're in and things are such a mess. Go to my brethren and say unto them, check this out, family, no longer servants, no longer friends. They have no right of inheritance. Family, however, check this out. Go to my brethren. He didn't say, go to the apostles and the prophets. Go to my brethren. Go to my brothers and sisters. And say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Do you notice what Jesus emphasizes above God, the title God? Why did he go to the cross and rise from the dead? And why were we included in that sacrifice? And how is it possible that when he was quickened and raised, 
we all were also quickened and raised together in him. So that we could come to know him as a father, as Abba Father, as Daddy God, not Jehovah, not Elohim, not uh, Adonai, not El Ohim, El, El Elyon, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Jireh. Those names are all valid names, but they are all they all fall within the confines of the name of Jesus. And he is the son that reveals the father. The heart of God is a father, and Jesus emphasizes father before God. That's why he said, go, tell my go to my brethren. Go to my brothers and sisters. Go to my family. Because they don't know it just yet. But what I've just done is going to enable them what it, is, it has opened up the way, and it is now enabling them to know the Father like I know the Father. And as a result, to love one another with the same love I just showed the whole world. It's the heart of the Father. One of these days we're going to wake up and realize there's another feast that is yet to be fulfilled. It's tabernacles. Tabernacles is the feast of the Father. And it's where the love that hung on the cross in the physical body of Christ actually beats in our chest toward one another. And we actually give a crap about one another instead of going off doing our own thing, worshiping angels and worshiping ourselves. Because, hey, God loves me no matter what, right? Not for us to keep being the bunch of miserable, self-absorbed buttheads that we've been being. If all I ever want to hear about is how much God loves me, oh, I just can't hear enough, just God loves me, God loves me, God loves me. Yeah, that's true, but he also loves you too much to let you stay the way that you are. And if something doesn't change, all we are going to become is, well, a bunch of one-way dead-end streets who supposedly have all this grace flowing into us but no outflow in many areas at all. It's just all about me and what God's showing me and what God's revealing to me and I saw angels and I saw gold dust and a gem appeared in thin air, but you're still the same you. And it's boring, to be honest with you. How many more signs are we going to run after? Until we allow that love that hung on the cross to be real and tangible in our hearts toward one another. Because, to be honest with you, that is really the source of what separates us and causes us to stand out as the light of the world. When you look at the way the world operates, driven by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the love of money, which is the root of all evil. If we're claiming that name that's above every name, then um, we shouldn't be like that. Scripture says that everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity, depart from self-seeking, self-serving. Love one another with a pure heart. No ulterior motive, no hidden agenda. Love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Go to my brethren, he says, and tell them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Remember Philip's question, Lord, show us the Father for God's sake already. Jesus said, have I been with you now for such a long time? And yet have you not known me, you little dipstick? He that sees me sees the Father. Not, quote, God, the Father. Romans chapter 8. Uh, well, let's read it. Romans chapter 8. Kind of all over the place today, ain't I? <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 15 
Oh, here, let's do verse 14 just for the sake of what I said earlier about worshiping and following after our bliss. That's no different than the people today who are like, you know, the world needs to hear my truth. What's your truth? Psalm 91, the psalmist says to the Lord, he says, Your truth shall be my shield and buckler, my armor. Jesus said in John 17 in the high priestly prayer, Father, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. I'm not so much interested in my truth. And to be frank with you, in some cases I'm not so much interested in hearing yours either. <laughs> it depends. I want to see how it relates to his truth and if in fact the revelation of his truth is changing our truth. My truth. Everybody has their own truth. There is only one truth. His name is Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And he said, no man comes into the Father but by me. The Father. Not God. The Father. Jesus is. <laughs> he is the very incarnate Godhead. Father, Son, Spirit in one. He is the express image of the Father's person. He's the brightness of His glory. And if you've seen Him, you've seen the Father. My truth. <laughs> Silly rabbit. Romans 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the bliss of God. You know, sometimes the leading of the Spirit is not very blissful. Sometimes the leading of the Spirit, oh my God, requires sacrifice so that the Lord can help someone else out through you. Sometimes the leading of, of the Spirit is not something enjoyable to our flesh, but it's His leading nonetheless. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Let Him be your bliss. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. There's that spirit of the slave or servant, where you constantly live in fear as to whether or not your obedience is enough, your performance is perfect enough, and then, of course, you have to maintain it. But you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, O oh God, O oh God, no, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You see, the spirit, he's not emphasizing doing. He's not emphasizing something we have to do. He is really bearing witness and giving testimony as to who we are. He is the solution to our current identity crisis. He's bearing witness that we are the children of God. If I know I am a child of God, it doesn't matter what I find myself doing. Because no matter what I do, no matter where I am, I am who he created me to be. And everything he has invested in me through inheritance, inheritance is biological transfer of characteristics. In biology, biological transfer of characteristics. My father can depend on me being me, his offspring, no matter where I am or what I'm doing. The doing isn't what's important. Me being who I am in Him. Man, it's what the world is looking for. And you too. One more place. Galatians chapter 4, which I quoted earlier, but let's just read it. Galatians 4, 4 to 7. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law 
to see everything in the Gospels all the way up unto the cross is classified as under the law. He, he was made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. So people that, hey, who still claim, oh, well, brother, you still got to, you know, you still got to observe the commandments and walk in the law because, I mean, the law has not become obsolete. Do you want to bet? He came to redeem us from being under it. Because under it, all we do is perceive God as a pharaoh. Moses is our taskmaster. Maybe sometimes in, in certain cases today, maybe we even view Jesus as our taskmaster. You know, a Christian is those who follows the commandments and the teachings of Jesus. Nothing could be further from the truth. A Christian, Christian is Christ-like. A Christian is supposed to be manifesting the resurrection life that Jesus Christ presently shares with the Father and should know the Father. And should ever be coming to know the Father more and more, even as Jesus knows the Father and is one with the Father. The Christian has discovered the mystery of their union with the Father in the physical body of Jesus. To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts crying, O oh God, O oh God, no. Abba, Father. There it is again. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus prayed to the Father, Abba, Father. Those are the three times, at least in the quote-unquote traditionally viewed New Covenant, which would include Matthew 26, I believe, where that phrase appears, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. Out of the mouth of two or three should every word be established. Jesus emphasized Father before God when he saw Mary in the garden. Go tell my brothers, not my servants or slaves, not my friends. Go tell my family that I ascend unto my Father and your Father, unto my God and your God. The heart of God is a Father. That's why we are sons. How, what do you mean sons? Well, a son has to have a father. So let's close in Romans 10, because we got way off the beaten trail. See, that spirit that cries, Abba, Father, that spirit is never going to say, who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. We'll talk more about this next time and hopefully come to a conclusion on this first one about who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above. But either way, the spirit that cries, Abba, Father, will never say either of those two things. Because that spirit is continually unveiling and revealing an ever-present Christ. That you, have to, that you don't have to go into heaven to bring down. You don't have to descend into deep to bring him up again from the dead. He is a present, indwelling Christ, and he is closer to us than the breath that we breathe. And it's time we start learning to hear that word. Because if we don't, all of our Bible school training, seminary training, and all that other stuff is kind of for naught because we've missed the whole point. We'll talk about this more next time. Hope you guys got something out of this today. Check out our website, www.todaysvoice.org. You can find out where we meet, meeting times, and any other, of any other goodies we got going on. Also, you can sign up to be on our email lists. I'll have some more uh, Today's Voice emails coming at you this week and next week. And uh, we will see you back here next time. All right. Have a good rest of your day. Love you and appreciate you.